The hazards brought on by COVID-19 have changed the vacation industry in a big way. But before the virus redefined how we spend our free time, the cruise ship industry was really taking off. Between 2009 and 2019, the cruise ship industry increased from 17.8 million annual passengers to 29.7 million on ocean cruises alone. And if you've ever been on a cruise ship, it's pretty easy to see why. Cruises are a chance to head out into the open ocean and have the time of your life. People use them to bond with friends, enjoy time with family, and of course, to celebrate their honeymoons. But not every honeymoon on a cruise ends well. And throughout the years, plenty of people have gone missing from these ships. So what would you do if your husband of 10 days disappeared from your honeymoon cruise? And who should be to blame for that? My name is Brianne, and I'm the host and creator of Among the Dirt and Trees, a show where we explore true crime cases that occur out in nature. In this episode, we're going to discuss the disappearance of George Smith, a man who left on a cruise with his new wife in 2005, only to disappear in the middle of the night during their stay. There's no disputing the fact that he was claimed by the sea, but there's definitely more to this story. A quick online search will reveal countless articles about how to plan the perfect honeymoon cruise. As a freelance writer who writes for a lot of travel agencies, I get requests to write content like this pretty often. At least I did before COVID took off in full force and turned cruise ships into floating plague boxes. But if we travel back to a time where cruise ships were still kind of safe, we'll learn that they still aren't as safe as we all thought. Unfortunately, George Smith and Jennifer Hagal did not know that. This happy couple was high on the joy of being freshly married. After their wedding, they departed for a lovely Royal Caribbean cruise that was set to take them to all kinds of exciting destinations. They were going to visit Italy, Turkey, and Greece. On paper, the cruise sounded amazing, but it didn't end that way. For those of you who haven't been on a cruise or who have lost the memories somewhere throughout the last year and several months of time spent only seeing the outside world through Netflix documentaries, I want to highlight a few parts of the cruise ship experience. When you get on a cruise ship for the first time, it feels like you're walking onto a castle. These ships are huge and filled with all kinds of fun event spaces. There are swimming pools, places to watch people perform, dance clubs, restaurants, casinos... And of course, bars. Even though you go on a cruise ship to reach a destination, there's absolutely no denying the fact that the cruise ship is an experience all by itself. For a lot of people, a cruise ship is a chance to spend literal days drunk, binging on good food from all kinds of different restaurants, and living a completely different life. It's an experience that you just can't get at home, but with time, it kind of weighs on you. Depending on where you're going and where you depart from, you can spend a couple of days on the ship before you reach a destination, or you might spend a week or more. When I went, I had, I believe, a total of six days before we reached our first destination. And it was during this time that I learned something about cruise ships and what it feels like to be locked on a ship with no way out. Now, my significant other, who once spent a total of 52 days out on the water as a sailor with the Navy, is going to laugh at me for this, but by the end of that first block of time, I was absolutely over being on a ship. The ship that seemed impossibly huge grew smaller by the day. People were loud and annoying, and I had one very big problem on my hands. I could not get drunk. Being from Colorado has all kinds of benefits if you're an athlete. People come here to train because of our high altitude, but with all this altitude comes one major disadvantage, and that is that drinking at sea level is a joke. <laughs> In Colorado, I process alcohol like a normal person, but anytime I visit sea level, it's like I am suddenly Dumbledore in the Half-Blood Prince drinking the creepy cave water. I just want to drink, 
but no matter how much I drink, it will not do its job. I'm basically just getting slowly poisoned until I'm ready to lie down, all while never feeling more than tipsy. <laughs> but alcohol aside, I was not the only one feeling the effects of being trapped on that boat. On the cruise, I watched so many fights between couples, parents snapping at their kids, and friends drunkenly arguing with each other. While cruises give you an opportunity to have fun and cut loose, they also have a tendency to put people who are drunk and annoyed with each other in close quarters, and that's what happened with Jennifer and George. On the night that George disappeared, he and Jennifer were out enjoying a night of drinking and partying. Cruise ships often have casinos and bars on them, and the focus of these spaces can vary by the hour. What starts out as a regular space for regular people eventually transitions to a space where singles are looking to hook up. But before that, it's just a non-stop evening party. During the night in question, George and Jennifer went to the casino, and then they opted for a little time at the bar. They were both incredibly drunk at this point, and... According to reports, they drank way past their fill and ultimately ended up having a fairly notable fight. Witnesses on the ship claimed that Jennifer was flirting with a man at the bar and George had something to say about it. So the end result of this fight was Jennifer storming off to the room and George staying with a few of his new cruise ship friends. The friends in this situation were anything but friendly by all accounts. George's new friends were four Russian men, and these men had accrued quite the reputation in their time on the ship. Various newspapers and magazines reported that this group of men was just terrorizing the ship the entire time that they were there in all kinds of different ways. Some reported them yelling all around the ship, notably shouting curse words and screaming about how powerful and unstoppable they were. You know, like you do. They were also just being horrible to the staff on the ship and were verbally abusing them. After one of them actually threatened to throw one of the staff members overboard if they didn't remember their luggage, they received a formal visit from security, and some of the staff were explicitly told not to answer the phone if they called again. pretty sure that we've all seen these kind of guys in public, and most of us judge them from afar, we, like roll our eyes and write a scathing Twitter thread about their behavior, but George didn't quietly judge them. Instead, he befriended them, and there might be a pretty good reason why his judgment was impaired. At some point during their trip, George managed to find a special kind of alcohol off the ship, which he promptly smuggled on board in the waistband of his pants. The banned alcohol in question was absinthe. So, in case you haven't spent a ridiculous amount of time reading Victorian fantasy novels like I have, you might only know absinthe by its general reputation of being kind of wild. But this alcohol, commonly referred to as the Green Fairy, is a combination of intoxicants that can absolutely mess you up. Real absinthe is actually illegal in the United States because of its hallucinogenic and sometimes toxic ingredients, most notably wormwood, which can really mess somebody up. As a general fun fact, in Romeo and Juliet, they actually list Wormwood, this intense toxin, as a way to stop babies from seeking out milk when a mother is ready to stop breastfeeding. So that's really fun, and hopefully that was just something that was made up, but I'm too afraid to fact check it. So <laughs> with that being said, you can get, uh, I'm doing air quotes, absinthe in the United States. It is not at all the same as it is in other places, though I'm fairly certain that any modern version is dull compared to what people drank back in the day, but I've had 
one cocktail with it. And I can say that I have never gotten so drunk from a single drink in my entire life. And for completely unrelated reasons, I also enjoyed the best burger of my life that night, so... So George and Jennifer were reportedly drinking this forbidden brew, and it seemed to be doing its job. Unfortunately, it did it a little too well. At some point, George stumbled back to his room with his new friends. In a perfect world, we could assume that they were making sure that he got back to his room safe, but... Given their unpleasant track record, this seems pretty unlikely. So, it looks pretty bad that these men were the last people to see George alive. The next notable point in the story began with Jennifer. Jennifer, who you will remember stormed off after her fight, was found blacked out in a hallway by security, who woke her up by putting ice cubes on her face. Effective, but horrible, I think we can all agree. Upon waking up, Jennifer stopped by her room and then headed over to a spa appointment that she had aboard the ship. She did not see George, but given the night's events and the fact that she woke up in a hallway, I also have to assume that she wasn't exactly looking for him either. With Jennifer gone and off to her appointment, a new character enters the story. A 16-year-old girl named Emily. Emily was doing what any teenage girl aboard a cruise ship would. She was looking for a chance to take a good photo so she could brag to her friends. And that was when she saw the blood smeared along the side of the boat. When security received news of the blood, they began looking for Jennifer and George because of the blood on their balcony and down below. George was never found, and the investigation took off. The most basic theory surrounding George's disappearance was that he was balancing on the balcony and fell overboard, likely injuring himself on the way down. Some reports suggested that he might have been outside having a nice cigar to follow up his night of drinking. Unfortunately, some reports also stated that there were bloody handprints that appeared to show that George tried to cling to the side of the boat before falling, which kind of implies that he was bloodied up before he fell. The most obvious theory, and the one that George's family supports, is the theory that George was murdered. The blood and the disappearance of George do seem to suggest that he probably was murdered. It's definitely pretty shady, all things considered. And police actually believe that it was a robbery gone wrong. They pursued the idea that the men with George attempted to rob him and ultimately killed him when he woke up. This theory was further supported by a video of the men themselves where they are openly joking about George's death. At one point, one of them makes a remark that seems to imply that he did something to George, but he doesn't outright say it, so it's kind of shady as far as evidence goes. The four men in question were never formally charged, but they certainly took some suspicious steps to cover their tracks. The first thing that they did upon returning from George's room was to order an absurd amount of room service. They just filled their entire room with food, which they promptly turned into a photo op. As if they were distinctly saying, see, we didn't do it. Look at all this food. We're just having a great time. We definitely didn't do a murder. And then there was something else. One of the men was a man named Gregory Rosenberg. He was the one who seemed to be the loudest and the most suspicious of the group, and in 2019, he was targeted in a hit and shot to death in his driveway when he returned home from Christmas shopping. While some suspect that he was killed to cover up evidence of George's murder, I'm not quite sure that I believe that. Killing him 14 years later doesn't seem like a great strategy, but it does kind of imply that Gregory and his pals were likely not good guys and were definitely not strangers to crime. 
There was even some kind of reference to the mafia in some of the stuff that I read. Then, of course, there is the question of Jennifer, and this is a particularly sore subject for the family. George's family believes that she is responsible for his death in some way, whether it was by playing a role in his death or simply allowing it to happen because she wasn't with him when he was targeted. His family tried to fight Jennifer every step of the way. When she received a million dollar settlement from Royal Caribbean, they attempted to dispute it. When she received George's personal belongings, they were vocal about their outrage. The tension between his family and his new wife has certainly played a role in the news story surrounding this case, but it's still unclear to me if they actually believe that Jennifer played a significant role in his death herself, which would obviously make this a much larger conspiracy. (laughs) What I find most shocking about the story is the fact that it started out so beautifully, you know? There is a loving couple trying to enjoy their time, celebrating their new status as husband and wife, and a series of bad decisions and questionable events paired together in the worst way to just bring out this devastating outcome. George's body was never found and no doubt vanished deep below the surface of the water, but the family still has questions and... Since the FBI already closed the case, it doesn't seem like they're going to get any answers for it. This won't be the last time that we talk about crimes on cruise ships, so if you are looking for someone to ruin your future vacations in post-pandemic times, I am your girl. Until our next episode, I would love to hear your theories about this case, so feel free to share them with me on Twitter or Instagram using the tag at datpod. And if you're sick of hearing all those pesky ads, head over to my Patreon at patreon.com slash like and inscribe to join our growing community and gain access to ad-free episodes as well as our community Discord. Thanks, guys. 